Hello, and welcome to another video lecture at MrWatkins.com. This one is on electron configurations. Now, this is going to be a very basic um, lecture on how electron configuration works, and um, this is really just background information. It's an introduction, maybe, if you will, um, for my pre-AP biology students so that they have an understanding of how the systems or how electrons are placed around, or we believe are placed around an atom, and how that works with the interactions of molecules. And it's important to understand the concept. When you go on to chemistry, you're going to get into a lot more detail. So let's talk about electron configuration. Electron configuration, basic idea, where are the electrons when they surround an atom? That's the basic idea. So let's have a look-see. Well, first let's build us a chart. In the past, you have been told that electrons travel around in shells, and those shells are numbered. And I'm just going to go to four here, and in biology, we're not too concerned much past um, the shell level of four. But um, the lower energy is up here with shell number one. It's also the shell that's closest to the uh, nucleus of an atom. So here's our low energy, and our energy increases as we move outward from the nucleus. Now. In this um, particular thing, you were told that um, the number of electrons for each one of these shells, and electrons we abbreviate with a little um, E with a line above it, the number of electrons for the first shell here is going to be 2. The number of electrons in the second shell will be um, 8. The number of electrons, total number in the third shell is going to be 18. And then the fourth shell is 32. Now, we need to be a little careful here because we're going to start getting into some really heavy-duty chemistry if we go past, um, say, three, uh, the shell 3. The piece that you need to understand to help you with the electron configuration has to do with an orbital. An orbital is kind of like the lanes in a track. We have a shell, but that shell can be broken down into smaller little categories or lanes that are called orbitals. The orbitals that um, we're going to be dealing with are S, P, D, and F. An S orbital can have at most two electrons in it. An S orbital is the lowest in energy. So when you look at the first shell, you can only have two electrons. It's only going to have an S orbital. So this shell right here, it has just one lane in it. If you think of the shells like a track, like for track and field, this track only has one lane. For the second shell, we can have eight electrons in that. Now, the orbitals still line up just like um, they do in the other ones, but or in all the other pieces, but you always start with the lowest energy level um, orbital. And again, this is going to be S, just like it was there. S can only have two electrons, so we have our two electrons, but that leaves six electrons left over. Those six electrons then go into the second level of the orbital, which is P. A P orbital will hold six electrons. So here we have our two electrons in an S and six electrons in a P. That gives us our total of eight for that second shell. Again, think of the shell like a track and the orbitals are the lanes. S is going to be the lane closest to the nucleus. P is going to be the lane just outside of S. We still have eight electrons in that shell, we've just divided them up into smaller lanes. For number three here, for shell three, we're going to start with S. We have two electrons. We've got P. We've got six electrons. We now have D, and that's ten electrons. Again, we're starting with the lowest energy and moving our way up. For the fourth shell, S orbital, next level up. P orbital, six electrons, next level up, D orbital, and then the next level up is F. We don't get down here very much in biology. This will be something you'll learn more in chemistry. We need to talk a little more about what this means as far as an orbital is concerned. Again, in pre-AP biology, this really isn't something you will ever be tested on. This is just to give you an understanding, it might help you with how uh, oxidation numbers are formed and when we start talking about redox reactions in photosynthesis and cellular respiration how things get oxidized and reduced 
Um, this may help you with your understanding of what's going on. But let's talk a little bit more about what these orbitals um, kind of mean or kind of what they're talking about. An S orbital has the lowest energy. I want you to think of the S orbital as a lane, a lane in a track that can hold two electrons. Now, if you've ever been on, say, a merry-go-round, and you're going around and around and around, you feel this pull of um, being thrown off of that merry-go-round if you weren't holding on. This S orbital, in fact, all these orbitals, they're also a way of describing, in a sense, the spin of electrons. Now, it's not actually the spin, and chemistry teachers are probably groaning everywhere that I said that. But for this atom not to be constantly spinning in one direction, its electrons have to spin basically in opposite directions. So in this s orbital, this little arrow represents an electron. If that electron is spinning up, then to kind of balance it out, we need an electron spinning down. So the s orbital really has that one lane in the shell one track, but there's really two runners, two electrons. They're running opposite each other. Kind of helps stabilize and balance things out. In the p orbital, we have six total electrons. The electrons want to be paired, so we're going to have three pairs. We still have our six lanes, but we've got three pairs. And so when we look at how the electrons are put into these, this p orbital, into these individual pairs, what we're going to be looking at is, um, or what we need to do is first put an electron in each spot that can be paired, and then go back in and put the electrons in that balance out those electrons that were first put in. So again, if we have an electron spinning up, then there should be an electron spinning down, spinning in the opposite direction. We're not really going to put that in yet. Um, I went ahead and did it, but we're not going to put that in yet until we've done our spinning up electrons and then we'll go back in and put our spinning down electrons in. Again, this is important because all of this just tells us that these spots need to be filled in such a way that it allows for the molecule or the atom to be stable. I think you can figure out how the D one works. 10 total electrons, that means we're going to have five spots for electrons to go. We're going to put them in each spot first, and then we're going to come back and put the electrons in that fit to balance that out. So how does all this work as far as figuring out electron configuration for a particular element? Well, let's take oxygen. That's going to be the easiest one for us to look at and the one that's most biologically important for us. So here's oxygen. Oxygen has an atomic number of eight. That means it has eight protons. That's its atomic number, eight protons. In a neutral atom, those eight protons there, they're going to need to be balanced charge-wise by eight electrons. Where are those electrons at? What's that electron configuration? So let's have a look-see. We're going to describe where these um, electrons are based on our electron configuration. And this is almost like saying X and Y when you plot a graph. Where are these electrons? Well, we have eight of them. We have the first shell, so we're going to tell us what shell it's in. We're going to look at the first orbital, lowest energy state possible here. We have eight electrons. Two will go in that shell. So we now have those eight electrons. We've gotten rid of two. We now have six electrons left over. We filled up the shell. So now we're going to move to the second shell, and we're going to describe where that sh those electrons are by their shell. So it's the second shell. We're going to start with the lowest energy state. That's S. S can have two electrons. So if we had taken two electrons out of this six, it's going to leave us four. So we certainly can fill up that, sh that orbital. But we have not filled up this shell. So let me subtract the number of electrons here. We're now down to four electrons, figuring out where they are. So here, we haven't filled up that second shell, so we got to say, all right, we're still in the second shell. And since we've already filled up the s orbital, we're now going to fill up the p orbital, or at least add electrons. We can have up to six, but we only have four left over, so we're going to put those four there. This is the electron configuration. It's showing us where these electrons are in space. This is the first shell. This is the second shell. 
This second shell has six electrons. Of those six electrons, two electrons are in S, one spinning one way, one spinning another. They're balanced. In the p orbital here, remember we are going to have three spots for electrons, paired electrons. We're going to have one, two, three, and then four. Remember we have to put our electrons in first, spinning one direction. Any that we have left over can spin the other direction. Now if you notice, as you look here, we have a pair here on the p orbital, but we have no pair here. There's nothing here and there's nothing here. This means that oxygen would like to fill this up. It's going to need to find the electrons somewhere to fill this up to, in, to stabilize this particular orbital. We have six electrons in this outer shell, that shell number two, but those, that shell is deficient by two electrons and it's because we want to have them paired here. Now again, this is not something that I'm going to specifically ask you on a test. I'm just introducing this topic so that you understand that oxygen wants to pick up two electrons. So oxygen wants these two electrons so that it's more stable. If it gets those two electrons, we say that oxygen has an oxidation number of negative two. And if it gets those two electrons, it's going to actually have a negative charge on it because it's picking up two extra negative charges. If we look at hydrogen, hydrogen has an atomic number of one. So that means it's going to have an electron configure of 1s1. For hydrogen, it's easier to get rid of this one instead of trying to pair it up. It's something special about hydrogen. Because of that, this hydrogen then has this s orbital, it's got the one electron in it, it's just going to get rid of it. Well, who would like to have ox uh, excuse me, electrons? That would be oxygen. This hydrogen can then share this electron with the oxygen, filling up that space. In fact, two hydrogens together, each one giving its electron or sharing its electron with oxygen, will allow that oxygen to have some stability because it's sharing electrons that can now make that opposite spin. Electron configuration is just writing out where the electrons are. The application is going to be in oxidation numbers. So there's another lecture that's on oxidation numbers. You may want to have a look at that and basically that's the second part of what we're talking about here. Again, this isn't something you're going to be tested on in pre-AP. There's a lot more to it. There's a lot more information that you need to have. But this gives you an idea of why molecules want to react to each other. Oxygen, hydrogen, calcium, nitrogen, phosphorus. These are all important molecules in biological systems. And your understanding of how they interact is going to be important for your understanding photosynthesis, cellular respiration, how DNA is used to form the molecules the proteins that we all need to survive. Please have a look-see at the next video lecture on oxidation numbers.